Thank you guys for coming. I'm so excited to see everybody here. Um, we had a really great two days in all of your communities. And um, so Swisher and Tiffin and Oxford and Lone Tree and Hills all got a, a tour from us this week. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce um, the Iowa Downtown Resource Center team that came to help. Uh, we have Jim Thompson over here, Jim Engel, Chris Patrick, Robin Bostrom, and Dennis Reynolds. Um, and and they'll, they'll talk about what they do and, and what they saw, but I just wanna uh, say thank you for coming and I hope you guys enjoyed having us there and take it away. Whoops. I'm going to pick on the chairs at the bottom now. Oh, there it goes. These won't work. It's just good. Side to side. Not up down. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Or good afternoon, I guess. Yeah. I'm hiding behind two chairs, it seems like. That's that's what we need to do today. Um, I'm Jim Engel, and I'm director of the Iowa Downtown Resource Center. Uh, we appreciate all the hospitality in, in all five communities we were in. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, we met most of it, but I, I just wanted to give you a, a kind of a brief explanation on, on what we've been doing. Um, the Iowa Downtown Resource Center provides um, opportunities for communities in, in the state of Iowa to do good things in their downtowns. So we do a lot of downtown networking things, uh, we do a lot of downtown educational things. We have some grant programs, but um, a lot of our time too is, is, is spent doing uh, assessments of local downtowns and, and uh, pointing out strengths and, and, and weaknesses and also making recommendations for communities based on our, our experience working around the state and around the country. So some of the assessments we do are, are more um, uh, longer I guess I should say downtown assessment business where we might be in uh, Boone, Iowa for, for three days where we really dig down deep and, and get to know the people and the community and the issues and strengths and weaknesses and then we, we react. But then we also do some mini type assessment visits that we call walk arounds where we'll, we'll focus on one community for an afternoon and do kind of a first impression visit. What we see, what we hear when we're there. Um, this visit was even a little bit different from that because we're doing five of those over the course of three days. So we visited Hills, Lone Tree, Oxford, Swisher, and Tiffin. And you Tiffin people gave us a real challenge because you don't have a dad. So we had, to react, we had to react a little bit differently in, in, in Tiffin. But we had, we had good days and what we did is we uh, met with a steering group or a group of leaders from each of those communities for about an hour and we asked a lot of open-ended questions about the, the downtown and the community too. We do downtown development, but we understand too in small towns, you gotta look at community-wide issues too. So we, we learned about the, the, the community and then we took about a 45 minute walking tour of, um, of each of the communities. I had been to each of the towns about a week in advance and took a lot of pictures too. And just, You'll see some of those come up today. Um, one thing that we always like to start with on these visits is we try to be brutally honest. We try to be honest. Sometimes it's brutal, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But no, I, I, I don't think you want anyone to come to sugarcoat things and, and, and pat you on the back and say you're doing a great job of leave. So, I mean, we, we, we do take a look at the communities. Um, and we're a little judgmental about that too. I mean, if we see um, issues, we'll, we'll point them out, but we're trying to be as constructive as we can on, the, on these visits. So that's kind of what we're doing here. Oops, I'm already behind. Oh, one thing I can mention though, is after this presentation, um, the five of us will also put together a document. Um, it's a written summary of the visit that will um, probably have a, a little bit more detail and the recommendations that we make than, than you hear today in our presentations. And that, that'll be back in about six weeks, and I'll send that to Sarah. And she, you can, Sarah, you can distribute that as, as you see fit. So this is, this is why we do what we do. You know, some communities have given up on the downtowns. They, they believe it's, it's, it's not important anymore. 
Um, not most communities. Uh, we, we talk to almost every community in the state sometime, you know, sometime or another. And they're, most of them are, are truly interested in making downtown better. But it really is a sense of community. It's hard to have a community unless you've got a, a gathering space that you can walk, shop, do banking, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's the center of commerce. Um, it, it's the home of interesting buildings, which I think define a community. Uh, it's the history of the community. Um, it's a meeting place. It represents tax base, and it's really a symbol of community vitality. So that's why we work in downtown areas. Um, a few years ago, uh, a, a small group of people in our office, I think it started with me and then Robin kind of perfected it, but we put together a, a, uh, a list of characteristics of a successful downtown. You can't see this, I understand that, but I'm gonna do this in the attachments that I send. And I would encourage each one of you when you get that, just to do a little self-assessment, check the box. Or maybe, maybe uh, you rate yourself one to five on all these things. Are you dog friendly? Uh, do you have weekend traffic? Uh, do you have storefront housing? That's a bad thing, by the way, storefront housing. We like to see it upstairs. I, I just looked, it was the first thing I saw, so I said, uh, but take a look at that list. I think there are about 10 different themes there. Um, we use this a lot when we work in downtowns. We didn't use this on our visit to talking to the people in the five communities this week. But it, it's, a, it's a nice tool. So I was thinking about when you get this report, how you prioritize things that we give you. And this is kind of the, the buckets that I thought these things would land. Because we're going to give you some recommendations. And I think some of them you're, you're going to say, hey, that's low paying fruit. We can do that. Second, oh, what a great idea. But there's no way in hell we can pull that off. Oh God, I did it already. I'm recording. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I can't do webinars. Uh, what a great idea, but but we can't pull that off. Three, who are these people? That is not something we even want to do. What I would encourage you to do when you get the report is really hit this list hard, number one, and don't ignore number two. Because I think you can't do this stuff. I think if you set your mind to it, get enough volunteers and you get some funding, you can do some of these ideas. Don't worry about this. We were wrong. Okay? <laughs> or give it time. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Think about it. That's right. So um, I'm good. we're going to go through each one of the five communities, but I'm going to start off with some um, um, challenges that we saw in all of the communities. Now, maybe not so much typically because some of these are strictly downtown challenges. But don't feel bad when I go through this list because if we would have worked in any county, it would have been the same list. Same, same, same common challenges we see all over the state. Um, one, one deals with organizational capacity or capability. So when, when Robin and, and Jim and I are traveling around the state and, and Chris and Dennis, we, we work a lot in really small towns. And I think the number one problem I always see is the communities have a great list of ideas. They've gone through thought processes, probably at the city council level, but quite often there is no group of people to implement any of those ideas. You know, I, I, I work in a lot of towns where it is just a city council, uh, maybe a very active mayor involved, but they don't really get it. They don't, they don't get ideas, they don't get the implementers, uh, and it's very difficult for them to knock off projects and get to be where they, they want to be. And we saw some of this here in Johnson County this, this week. Um, one, one, one thing I wanted to share, sorry about my handwriting and all that stuff, but when we were in uh, Hills, um, Hills has a hometown pride committee, and that's a committee um, associated with the Keep Iowa Beautiful program. So Hills has a community coach, and Sarah has been working with that group too. And uh, Sarah showed me this list. I mean, they already have a prioritized list of projects that they can start to knock off. So that's, a, that's what we want to see. We want, we want to see people getting together and talking and ideas coming out and prioritizing projects. Some are small, some of them are mid-level, some are big home run kind of projects. 
Um, but home, the hometown pride group in Hills already had a list of uh, uh, three, six, seven things that they're going to start working on. So I guess recommendations, that's what we're talking about. And continue to do grassroots recruiting and communicating to activate leaders and volunteers. It's really the only way this could happen. And I kind of some towns don't like committees. The whole Main Street approach is based on a committee system, but I haven't seen a better way than the group get the action teams together to do these things yeah, based on uh, volunteers. Uh, so we would like to see <coughs> the communities in Johnson County in the next six months have a list like that, a list of priorities. Low, I would divide it up into the very easy things, the low hanging fruit that you can knock off right away, maybe some mid-level successes, and, uh, and then maybe some kind of a long-term home run that's gonna take some plan, like, like building a downtown, and that's, that's a home run. So that's what we would like to see. And I think you're going to need um, action teams for, for each one of those. But I, I would start with a list that's probably no bigger than what the Hills team might look here. Um, also under organizational capacity, I, I got to say something, and I think the whole team agreed. I've never been on one of these visits before where I had one supervisor from the county following or following me around we have five of them <laughs> and that was great that was great that was so fantastic i i talked to very few county supervisors when we're doing these visits so we were very impressed that this uh, this group um cares enough about the small towns in, in the county that they would show up and try to, to form partnerships already um that was really cool Simple, take advantage of those county resources. I got a dollar sign up here, so I'm already trying to give your money away, you guys. <laughs> but there, there, I don't think any of you would disagree that that's, that's an option. You know, if you get good projects, um, that there, there could be some money available. And there's some programs they even have available. They've, they've talked about the inspectors possibly working in the small towns in the, in the county. Um, we heard good ideas coming out of the, the supervisors. And then the, the Better Together 2030 program, which uh, ICAD is uh, facilitating, uh, get involved in that. But I'm um, fully taking advantage of that. I just, I think this was a poster that was in the Hills Bank, I believe, talking about the rehab or emergency home repair grant. Uh, things like this can really help your community. So that's the first common challenge. Um, the second, and again, we see this in every small town we work in, and um, I think it's one of the most um, important, um, urgent matters. Um, you don't want to lose your downtown. We work in some downtowns where you can walk down the, down the, the sidewalks and, and, and see sky through the roof from the upper story buildings. You don't want that to happen. If you lose a building, it's really hard to replace it. And then you start to lose physical capacity in your downtown, which is no good. So um, working on underperforming buildings is not easy. It's not an easy thing. It's, it's quite an endeavor um, because you need a lot of different funding sources to rehab these buildings. Uh, the owners, um, city, uh, grant programs, you name it. And Jim's always traveling the state trying to help communities with financing to get things uh, done in the area of building building improvements. Um, one thing that we always talk about uh, with, with underperforming buildings too, or with, with, I'm sorry, with any building in a downtown, and I think we've heard maybe this here too, there seemed to be a lack of knowledge about individual buildings and tenants and vacancies and who owns that building and are they selling it or not? There are just a lot of questions. Um, so we always, in every community we work with, uh, recommend um, some kind of a building or business inventory, and we'll send you a sample of that. It just has all of the information relating to that building, address, a photo of the building, who owns it, the square footage, what its use was, what its use is now, um, condition of the building, uh, lots of different things here. It really helps you to be, to be um, nimble and to be able to react if you have a potential buyer or you have somebody who wants to uh, uh, do a project with the building, it, it, it's good plan. 
it, it's, it's kind of drudgery, I guess, putting this kind of stuff together, this kind of a database, but it, it, it's a really good idea. Um, also, um, incentives, I wanted to mention that too. And I, I think with each of the communities, we're probably gonna talk about this a little bit more in detail too, but I, I just wanted to throw one incentive out. It, it's hard to get buildings rehabbed uh, without incentivizing those. You can have local incentives, there are federal incentives, there are statewide incentives. And the one I just wanted to key in on because it's been a very successful uh, program, Jim happens to administer it, um, is the um, Community Catalyst Building Remediation Program. Terrible name, we call it the Catalyst Program. Um, but it is uh, designed to rehab buildings more than likely in a small community. Um, we, we have a $100,000 grant. It's an annual process. The city must apply for the, the grant, usually on behalf of a property owner. So there's an agreement with that property owner. And uh, Jim, how many projects have we done around the state in five years? 200, 200 projects have been done. And 40% of the money that has to go to communities that are 15, 1,500 and under population. So it really was designed to help out the small towns. Um, I don't, we don't dissuade the larger towns from applying from that, that grant either. Um, but every one of your communities could apply for this grant based on the building that we saw. I'm even including Pippin in that because uh, uh, Slim's building probably could, could apply for that, that grant. I don't know what's going on with that building. Um, but I think there's potential for every one of these. I think Jim and I, we've been doing this so long, we walk around town, that's how we identify buildings, because that's a catalyst, a uh, potential correct catalyst application. Um, another common challenge, again, we see this in every town. Uh, you guys are kind of lucky that we did this in March. Um, if we would did it did in August, we, we'd be up here complaining about weeds growing in the sidewalks. We couldn't see any weeds because they're not growing there. Um, but I think this is one area that we're constantly disappointed that communities don't have some kind of a, uh, a process to keep the, the downtown clean and looking good. And uh, some of the communities we're in here had some problems with that, but it really is important um, for community pride to get maintenance done. Uh, we recommend every town we're in to do some kind of a cleanup day. Uh, maybe it's a spring cleanup. Not only does it make your downtown look better, your community look better, but it's kind of an image promotion that fires people up. Uh, you can use those volunteers to get them involved in other things that you do. Um, and then and we drove, this is a downtown visit, but we did drive through neighborhoods when we were here too. Just like any town in the state, you got some neighborhoods that need help. Uh, residential neighborhoods too. Um, and this is just an example of instilling some pride, doing some kind of a recognition program for, for the, the places that keep their, their properties at the Art of Money Award or something like that. And then um, this is a common one too. Um, you know, that list I was telling you about, uh, the, the, the characteristics of a successful downtown. This shows up big on that list because <clears throat> I would say most of the small towns we're in, when you walk down the sidewalks, it's, it, it tends to be a sterile, uh, not exciting pedestrian experience. Uh, some communities do a really good job with that. It takes some creativity, it takes some money, um, but downtown really is your community's front porch. So we like to see communities prior prioritize the pedestrian experience, make it safe, make, make it comfortable, make it attractive and make it something that we would remember. Um, I'm looking outside now with the playground equipment the kids playing and that's, that's memorable to me. Um, but oftentimes you get this kind of thing going on where there's just nothing down there to, to walk by. And especially if you don't have businesses, there's no reason to walk down there. Um, when I took pictures a couple of weeks ago or a week ago, um, I don't want to offend anyone here, but the first town I went to was Lone Tree, and as I was approaching the downtown, I, I saw this blue. I thought that looks fun, but when I got up there, it was this. It was garbage bins, 
right? Right on your sidewalk. And uh, I think there's an alley problem, right? And where was that Oxford? I guess Oxford's in that alley. But there's got to be a solution, yeah. you know, to, 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 to avoid that kind of thing. I don't know if those are out there all the time, this kind of unsightly thing. Um, but take advantage of, of things like this. I mean, we like to see benches, art, color, plantings, um, nice waste receptacles, garbage bins, lighting, um, attractive garbage bins, I'm sorry, lighting. <laughs> uh, blade signs, the kind that, that, that serve pedestrians that hang out from the side of the building, outdoor seating or dining, public art, cleanliness, vacant windows, attractive. Also, when we were in Lone Tree, you talked about the butterfly benches that are coming up. We're excited to see those. That's one example of something that you can you can do down there. But just make the pedestrian experience a, a, a better thing. I would encourage every one of the communities we were in to get a group of people, get your city council, get anyone involved, and do what we did, and just take a walk and make some notes. You've lived here so long that you don't see that six feet of weed growing there. We see it. Or visitors. I mean, it, it just hits us in the face. So take a walk and identify those things and come up with some ideas. I know you all have talent in your downtown. Can maybe look at some of these kinds of projects? And I, I, um, I have a colleague that's on these visits a lot, Jeff Geertz, and he, he loves this stuff. So he's put together some slides. I'm not going to talk much about these, but I just want to show you some of the examples of, of, um, of ideas to uh, provide more excitement with the pedestrian experience. And Jeff kind of labeled all the different things on this slide that you can look at. Bike racks, business signs, lighting, wayfinding, et cetera. All, all bringing color and interesting ideas for downtown areas. You just want to avoid that sterile land downtown, especially in the winter. It's, it's really stark when it's cold and you just don't see anything when you're walking there. But you see some of the plantings and bump outs. I mean, some towns actually have games in their, their downtown district, interactive things that people can do. Pavement, pavement paints is really inexpensive. Right. So one of those low cost, high impact sort of things. Right. They don't have to be brick pavers. Yeah, what's the town um, that's south of Waterloo that has an artist and they do really interesting paintings on the pavement? Uh, it's not coming to me right now. Um, but one of them, it looks like a hole. Oh, oh yeah. So it looks like you're going to fall in. Oh, nice. Dizer. 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 Yeah. yeah. And uh, a, a lot of communities have actually partnered with uh, local companies or schools that actually produce things like this. Or even paint them. Oh, we're all ready to hill. So I'm going to turn it over. That's some of common challenges. I'm going to turn it over to Chris, who's going to do hills right now. Thank you. So we were greeted with a great group at Hills. I want to thank everybody for being there. We had, a, we had Tim, we had Kelly from the city, and several of the supervisors. And that really got us on a great start. And each of these communities has a really unique personality, even though there's some commonalities. And so we're going to kind of jump into a little bit of those. Some of the strengths that the group that gathered with us identified were the employers. They have 600 employees in downtown Hills. Who knew, right? I didn't know. And that is absolutely fabulous. Hills Bank has made a intentional decision to stay where they started. They started in 1904 and they're still there today. Um, Spetsman's, the um, agricultural chemical group that also does materials, they're there with 200 uh, people. And then we also have some industrial along the, the interstate. There's also really great corporate donors to the events that are happening in Hills. So we have engaged corporate citizens. Uh, the housing development, Oak Crest Hills, I believe. Oak Crest Hill Estates. Hill Estates, um, 200, both numbers, uh, 200, uh, Housing units, we also have the two rows of zero lot lines in that. So one of the things that we'll be talking about in a minute is how we're going to really, you can bring the downtown into that community. So um, there's a little more pedestrian. Here is their splash pad that they talked about that was really exciting. It was 
on the north, I believe, of the department, the development. And then uh, Jim touched on the hometown pride, that they're really or, you know, getting organized there. Um, talk a little bit about Hills Bank and how they have um, been there at a great time. But think of them also as captive consumers. They're there all day. So what can you do? What can you provide them? But they're spending their dollars, right? Um, you're not just giving them up, but you're actually spending those dollars there. Maybe you can do some pop-up shops um, so, and some restaurants and some food trucks. So not everybody is going to Casey's for a pizza, even though it's delicious, but we're getting more people in the door at 218. And you have that potential of redeveloping your restaurant um, that's already there. The summer concert series, we heard a lot about that. So we added the, the bandstand with the lights. Um, that is a really great way to bring the community together. But maybe you can also do some mini series on the vacant lot that the city has um, just south of, or just east of the community center. And then Old 218 Tap is definitely a street through the downtown. And the fact that the city owns that vacant lot where you can really program it now for outdoor events, pop-up shops, I'm talking about the Songbird Sanctuary is another really great thing, but it's also there where those things can move. So if somebody wants to develop a brick and mortar building there, you have that potential. So some of the challenges that we um, talked about were the connection to Oak Crest Hill Estates. And you can see this is what it looks like today. And the grain and feed is a little over here. Um, but some of the things that you can do is to make sure that you're having that walkway, that sidewalk that leads up into the community. Since you are crossing the road, road depending on what those life safety issues are there, maybe some nice decorative black fencing to keep those pedestrians safe before they cross the tracks. Um, also, we'll touch on this in a second, making sure that that environment is not so sterile. There's a lot of cement, a lot of um, things that are not really popping for the eye to see. So keeping those plantings that we'll talk about coming into this area, making sure there's that safety for the railroad, even painted sidewalks. Even get the kids out there during the summer and do sidewalk art down your sidewalks, right? Something to really keep the um, community engaged in what you're doing, making them aware of the things that you're going to continue to do. Because once you get the kids, right, you're going to have those parents. And then this is the bank. Again, 400 employees. And the bank's just going to stick with me the rest of my life that you have so many um, people in that building. But a pretty sterile front. So some of the things that you can do would be to add planters and a bench, like each of those columns, making sure that people can come outside a little bit more and sit. There was a small area behind the building where people can have lunch. But make sure that there are more spaces in the downtown that you can actually sit outside, and enjoy the weather, except that it's snowing. Um, and then the community center is the same way across the street. You can really tie your whole downtown into the Oak Hill um, Press uh, Estates with just some very simple streetscape things that don't cost a lot of money. And we didn't draw it, but something simple would be attaching banners to the buildings at each of the, those mm -hmm. columns. It could stick out perpendicular, color, movement, breaks up that really harsh hard facade. And you do have banners right now. They're up a little high for me. It's like it really kind of have to set my head up to see them. So maybe a little bit bigger banner, making sure that um, working with the community and maybe some of the students um, in a high school to develop some new designs for banners. So you're really switching them out throughout the year. And streetscape focal points. Again, thinking about the whole downtown, almost even going out to that Casey's as one unit. This is your gateway. Um, we can do some bump outs and some bio where you're really taking care of some of that water, uh, rainwater damage. Um, and then benches. They don't have to be just a sterile black bench, but they can be um, something that honors a citizen. Memorial benches. These have actually a picture on them, which is really, really cool. And then up in the right in the left corner is a painted bench. So again, how can you get your community involved? You have artists 
that would love to do these things? Do you have somebody that works in steel? Um, you can really do a lot with the community members that you have. Again, captive audience with your employers, but what employees, but what about their spouses? Maybe they're really into crafting. Maybe they're really into quilting. Some of those things you can really bring into the pop-up shop that we're gonna talk about. There it is, um, in that vacant lot. And so yes, there you should, woohoo, for what you did in Jewel. This is their um, pop-up shops that are portable, so they're not there all the time. But then that way um, they can be rented for a month or three months or six months. We've seen a lot of different varieties, templates for that type of experience. Or you can do something a little bit more permanent like they do in Uptown area. Where that building is there, you can see that it's really strong structure that's gonna survive throughout the different seasons. Again, you're trying to develop those entrepreneurs in your community. And I'll tell you what, they're there. If they're in Sheraton, a little Derby, Iowa, where I live, um, they're everywhere. It's just a matter of having a communication, talking to the people at Hills Bank, working through their management. So maybe you can do some survey work and see what kinds of things that the people that are working in your community want to do there, what they want to eat, and what they like to do recreation-wise. And you can maybe fill a void in their lives. And by the way, we, we like this idea to on the east end of downtown on that lot that city controls. Uh, we like it at anchors uh, the downtown on that end with activity. We also like that because it can be short term and then if it ripens and a building wants a building site downtown, you haven't committed something to the site that you can't take away. And we like your plans for the butterfly garden and such, but you'll see a drawing I have that has an alternative location for that perhaps. Because once you do a butterfly garden, it's pretty hard to give it up. So these are just different ideas for screening. You have the back side of an apartment that not everybody might want to look at, right? And there's some things on the ground that maybe we don't want to trip over. So here are three very different kinds of screening. Um, it can be metal, it can be wood, it does not have to be sophisticated, but it has to represent your identity. So make sure that all of these things that we're doing really tie together to who Hills is. And I think Sarah's a fantastic resource that you have I mean, you should really thank your supervisors for um, allowing her to work with you in your communities. So this one is just very simple um, metal. It does have a little artistic piece here, so you can kind of see it through because you don't want to necessarily take all the light from those residents in that complex. Again, working with um, schools, working with maybe an industry, or even with a uh, University of Iowa, these um, iron pieces are not that hard to um, create. Again, a contest, bringing people in to make that design up. And then this wall over here, the slats that is open on the bottom, it can be a green living wall. So you can have plants growing out of that during the summer. And then maybe some low bushes that would be there all year long to keep everything screen. And that's going to be a nice backdrop to whatever you do whether it's the Songbird Sanctuary, the pop-up shops, or the food trucks. <clears throat> so let's really talk about that economic development piece. Um, with that building you have that's now sitting empty. Um, there are several ways um, to partner together, the county partnerships, to really help the owners of that building um, get the word out that they are wanting to sell, not just the sign in front, but are you using social media to your best advantage? both city-wide um, and other through the organizations, social organizations in your community. And then make sure that you're communicating to other existing businesses. Again, getting the word out to that industrial strip. Again, you don't know what their spouses might be wanting to do. Maybe they do want to utilize that turnkey restaurant. Incredible, almost everything is there. And then the turnkey front space with an apartment above. What a great asset to have in your community. Um, another thing that we had talked about is wayfinding and signage. Making sure that all of the signs to your community match so that you're really giving, again, that identity. What is your identity? Um, and then wayfinding through your community so we know where um, 
the schools are, and we know where your senior center is. And then another idea to keep um, a kiosk in your downtown so people can put their flyers of different events that are going on in the downtown and some key phone numbers. So you don't have to go inside. Dennis, are you going to say something? Nope. All right. Good. So we are leading up to Dennis's drawing and we're utilizing core buildings to enhance pedestrian traffic. So in a different world, what would happen if we repurposed this building um, that Stensman's is spraying autos in into something else? So we have that pedestrian flow. Maybe you can have a restaurant and I'm gonna let Dennis talk about his image. Uh, so this did. one, this one, I'm often the guy who is the third person that Jim mentioned and you go, what was he thinking? So, uh, and that's okay. I mean, if I push you in a direction, it doesn't have to be all the way. Maybe it can be. But anyway, so this is the, on the left is the bank building. On the right is the Stutzman uh, building, which we love. And if anybody's here from Stutzman, we didn't get to talk with you, but We'd love to talk to you about, you know, can this building have a higher purpose than what it's currently being used for? Uh, and there's a vacant lot in between. So we heard the bank wanted to expand. So this shows an expansion for the bank on the back two thirds or three fourths of the property. So there's an alley back there. So from there up towards the street uh, is an expansion and it shows a two story expansion with a big bank of glass because the building's pretty dark inside. And if I want to work there and stay there or be recruited to work there, I'd really like to have an office space or conference space with big windows looking out on something. <clears throat> and so from the expansion to the street, I left about 15 feet for a park. And the thinking would be instead of uh, the Butterfly Songbird Park at the east end that we covet for development, this could be that function. It could be a butterfly uh, park, a great thing to look out as you're working. You could have outdoor meetings. Uh, it can have public art, uh, and so uh, really, uh, it's a real benefit to both the uh, bank and their employees, as well as the community. <clears throat> the, the neat stone building, uh, someone's done a wonderful job of decorative painting on the top, and amen, keep that up. And so we just did continue that decorative painting on the lower three-fourths of the building. <clears throat> and then we put back in the original storefront windows and transom windows above that. And we think a great use would be a coffee shop, bakery. Uh, and so maybe your employees will get there a little earlier because they're going to stop in and get their coffee and bagel on their way to work right there. Uh, park and grab and go, I think, was something that Robin likes to say. So, um, And then there's a metal building next to it. And we just took the walls off it but left the roof on it. So it can be a outdoor pavilion that's covered from the weather. You can sit out there and eat your bagel and have your coffee. So we will have a few more details in the written report, but that is what uh, we have for the slides for Hills. So thanks for oh, being here. So is there one more slide? Oh, Maybe it didn't it? make the show. Maybe it did. I don't think it did. The other uh, easier slide is the bank on the west facade is very blank. Uh, and it's a gateway right next to this Dustin building. So we think it's a great place to put a mural. And maybe it's even a mural that shows the historic, the historic original Hills Bank. Uh, so it, it speaks to their mission, uh, it gives something interesting, and really enlivens that, that blank facade. So we'll get that image in the report for you. Today. Thanks, Dennis. My name is Jim Thompson. I'm known statewide as Jimmy T. And the reason is my boss is named Jim, and so I just migrated to a brand. And so he's right. What I do is I try to find money for projects, period. That's all I do. My kids asked me, so dad, you have a weird job. What is it you do? And it wasn't good enough to say that I find money for projects. And here's what I said. I exclusively work with progressive communities that choose to save themselves. If one of our five towns that we worked in chooses not to save itself, have a good day. You're not going to work with me. Okay? But if you have things you want to do and we can work together and partner with the county, wouldn't that be cool if city, county, state, and federal government can find money for projects? Because that's what we can bring to the table. So when we're thinking about Lone Tree, now, 
just so you guys know, um, never my intention to ever offend anyone, but if you ask me a direct question, you're gonna get a direct answer. So my first impression, when we went into Lone Tree, you're gonna see it in a second, you can't tell for sure, but the water tower needs cleaned. And so let's figure out as a capital improvement project, because those are cheap, but how can we figure that out? The city needs to set the standard, the city of Lone Tree needs to set the standard for the community. If you're gonna allow underperforming properties and they're yours that you control as the city, that's the example you're setting for the rest of the town. As we drove around and looked at some of the neighborhoods, they did not like it when I said, oh, some of your neighborhoods are underperforming. Just like Jim said in the beginning, please get in the car, drive around your town, look at your neighborhoods, walk your downtowns, because you will, when you take your rose-colored glasses off, you will see the same things that we saw. And it's important for you to identify them and how can we fix it? And this is a marathon. This is not a sprint. Sometimes, Jim talked about, we identify buildings that are eligible for a catalyst. We can do that in every town we visit. The problem is never finding a building that qualifies for a $100,000 catalyst grant. The issue is finding a progressive property owner that we can partner with to invest a $100,000 catalyst grant, okay? So the property owners is the key. Um, sometimes you have to be a little patient. The one that owns it today might not be the one that's gonna improve it, but let's keep it on our list. Love, one of the last things we saw when we were in Lone Tree was we went to Julie's shop and she says, we have these really, really cool ideas from Iowa Living Roadways. It was done in 2006. As a group to get things done in Lone Tree, please start with those recommendations. Many of the things that were identified in that report, and they have all of the designs there, you need to consider working toward implementing those. We've worked as, as the Iowa Downtown Resource Center and Main Street, Iowa, we've worked with Living Roadways forever, okay? And we've implemented those across the state in very progressive communities that are working on their gateways, working on cleanup activities. They even had some really cool designs for some building improvements there. But those are valid, and we really need to start with that. Um, love the, the K-12 school system there, partnered with the Wellness Center and other amenities. It's like, boy, how could you live in Lone Tree and not be proud of the school system? So if that's where we're gonna start, let's rally around that pride and how can we drag that down into our community, the rest of our community, and work through that. They have a local foundation that seems to be very progressive, a chamber of commerce, an active American legion that's getting things done. The events that we talked about, and it was really cool, Art in the Park, Farmer's Market, and then Julie um, at the flower shop has a Julie's Winter Market. And it seemed, it's pretty new, but it's very successful. Please check it out. The deeply rooted rehab is really, really cool interior rehab and a great business model. If you haven't been there, please check that out too. And then we heard, and Jim mentioned it, we heard about the butterfly benches. Uh, we haven't seen them, but we're really excited about what that could do to change the way downtown functions. Now, okay, I got through the strings. <laughs> You, now, you hated to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you knew I was going to go to the challenge. Yeah. So driving into town.
driving into town, we saw this sign that at the former grocery store, that half of it is blown off. Right there, this canopy that this is your first impression. Something needs to be done with this. Now, Iowa code allows you a certain time frame. Iowa code says, get these down, okay? Have those conversations. Jim's talking about a building and business inventory. That property owner needs to be on Lone Tree speed dial. They need to be saying, we've got to fix this up because we look like crap when people come to town, okay? We're, walk, we're driving by that, we're walking by that. And then Jim mentioned it also, I used the same photo, but the, the trash cans, that needs to be just a conversation. Glad people live upstairs, but your first impression shouldn't be trash containers sitting in front of vacant space that you want to occupy. A whole lot of the space in downtown Lone Tree is underperforming and it needs to be better. And we can do it when we work on it together. Now, building rehab, this is the funeral home. Um, we understand, talking to the fire department, that upstairs is really in rough shape. But housing is critical in every rural community I work in. And here's an opportunity with that square footage that's underperforming that we need to figure out how to get money to do that project. We have grant money to pay for that, to help pay for that, okay? So property owners get a better return on investment when their whole building is income producing. That's just math. So it costs you money when it's vacant. That's what's going on with this. It's lost revenue potential. Now, I'm gonna talk about it next, but Lone Tree, unfortunately, has had really bad building rehab advice. You roll into town and you see a whole lot of metal, ugly, okay? You see a whole lot of mansard roofs, just like this, including on City Hall. So I'm back to City Hall, time for us to set the stage for we're gonna do pride in place and do it appropriately. Now I talk to lots of contractors doing the real estate work that I do, and they say, why in the world would we have flat roofs in Iowa? I don't care what roof you have, including flat, if you don't care for them, they're gonna fail. Flat roofs really work and really perform if you care for them. But guess what? Even mansard roofs, when you get duratio, I laugh about that because when I was a kid, it was straight line winds. Now, what does duratio mean? Straight line winds. <laughs> so we get duratio that comes in and it blows shingles off and roofs fail. They start leaking. Flat roofs work if you, uh, you just have to rehab them. But here's a prime example of a building underperforming. Now, I mentioned, I love this building. It's a whole lot better interior rehab than it is exterior. So a lot of bad advice again, mansard roof. This addition that was put on the top looks a whole lot better from the inside looking out than the outside looking in. Wasn't appropriate to the building, but I'm not suggesting change that, okay? Great business, but that's an opportunity, probably the best business that we saw on, on walking up and down the street. Now, we're gonna give all towns, Sarah, <laughs> all five towns, this is a, a downtown design guide. Uh, you would not believe the bureaucracy that happens at state government, maybe you would. Um, it took us 20 years to finally figure out that it was okay for us to create suggestions on what we would like to see from a design perspective. This is a download that you can have and please download it. It's got examples of don't do this. So we have pitch roofs that they put on commercial buildings that look like a roof that flew in from outer space, okay? 
do a flat roof, but just improve it. So all the way through this document, it's 50 some pages long, but it's like, don't board up your upper story windows. When you board them up, you can't occupy them because you can't meet any of the code that allows somebody to live there. When you have upper story apartments, it's really a good idea to put bedrooms next to the windows so that you can meet that second egress. Because most code officials, you have a stairway going up, the code officials say, if you have a bucket truck or a ladder for the fire department and the bedrooms next to that exterior window, that can serve as a second egress. Talk to your fire marshals about that. But it's a really good idea. This is something that's relatively simple for you to adopt. What we would really encourage though, is if the cities create any matching money, and maybe if, if the counties would consider partnering with them on some matching money, that you adhere to a appropriate design guide to do that. Why invest in something that you're not proud of, okay? So here's the recommendations for Lone Tree. Um, really work on the, the Lone Tree R3. It's a betterment group that's really trying to get going. If there was one thing that I really want to be a broken record about is use and abuse Sarah. She knows how to do this. Just use. Not Just abuse. <laughs> 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 she knows how to do this work. She has all of us on her speed dial, so we can help her with some of this. We've got to do it together so that we can make these towns work. And Johnson County, I got to say, um, especially with Jim acknowledging the supervisors and the role that you played, I talked to each one of you individually as, as you were doing our walking tours. I'm super excited about what you guys could do here. This could be the example at a county level for the state of Iowa. And it's right in front of you. So let's figure out how to do it. I want to help. The former grocery store sign, I already said, let's get it down, adopt the design guidelines, consider those local incentives so that we can be proud of the money we're reinvesting, change the gar garbage bin location. This might just be a conversation with them. Is there a better place to do it than right here? <laughs> Dennis is going to talk in a second about some infill residential, but some of the best buildings that you have are along Commercial Street. And if something's not done, we call this demolition by neglect. These buildings are going to fall down if they're not improved. When we did our walking tour, we saw some obvious signs of tuck pointing and other kinds of things that it's, we're gonna have a problem with those. And so either clean them up or fix them up and it, I'd rather you fix them up. And then the one real lacking piece in Lone Tree was the restaurant improvement. Um, recruitment, we need to be able to get some other food options there. There's places to locate. We gotta get them cleaned up. The best businesses wanna locate in the best building spaces you have some available space that just needs to be cleaned up. And the last thing I wanted to show you um, about Lone Tree was, um, I did this walk around in a small town in Southwest Iowa called Macedonia, a tiny little town that's very tied to agriculture, smaller than Lone Tree, considerably, okay? They had elevation changes on their sidewalk also. If you haven't been to Lone Tree for a while, if you park a little farther down the street, it feels like you have to go quite a ways to get to that storefront. I'm nervous about somebody falling off that sidewalk. When we did the walking tour, several of us talked about it. You're shaking your head. This is what they did there. It, it's a metal uh, CNC that they used, but these were all donated um, mostly by community members, but these were farmers that lived outside of town. Think about this from the county again. Farmers outside of town said, wait a second, this is my hometown. I don't live there, but this is, this is my hometown. And they wanted to give back to it. So they did these really cool renditions. They're up and down the street. If you ever get to Southwest Iowa, it's worth the trip. 
Dennis. All right. This is Commercial Street. All right. And, and by the way, we didn't really do introductions, but my childhood and teenage years was spent around small farm towns, which I absolutely love. Uh, and then the next, my 30 years of my first 30 years of my career, I was design director for a large international architecture firms. In the last 10 years, I've had my own firm. And what's really nice is I've been able to match that passion of my youth with the experience of my career with this flat final phase of my uh, of my own business and bring that to communities like you. So that's why I really love doing this. Uh, so you, I didn't want you to think this guy's just making this stuff up, you know. Um, he does just I, make, I just make it up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I wish all these communities I could do two or three drawings, but I only had time to do one drawing each. But Commercial Street uh, really has a one, two, three, four really nice brick buildings and a metal building. Uh, and I'm going to start with the metal building because it's the easiest on the far on the, on the second one in metal building. What do you do with it? Well, I just put a big super mural on it and you don't have a lone tree. So I put a lone tree on it, you know, uh, and uh, there you go. Done. Um, we really like, by the way, how this row of buildings face railroad park, which is a really nice asset to the community. So uh, if I was going to live in the upper floor I have a nice view as well. So then some infill next to the Lone Tree building and then the two buildings over, uh, they're just simple, they're not brick. You're not gonna be able to afford brick and make the pro forma work. Uh, they're just stick built wood buildings. The first 20 feet can be uh, commercial. They may be more uh, service type uh, office uses as opposed to retail, uh, but they might be retail. And then the back of the first floor is residential and then residential above. All these buildings have an alley access, which really helps so you can have uh, driveways that connect up to uh, freestanding garages uh, and outdoor space on the ground level, uh, which is really unique in a downtown situation. Um, and the white box is one, two, three, four, five of them there on the left side. Uh, that might be a more of a townhome, a live work townhome uh, approach. So again, the first 20 feet is set up for uh, commercial. Uh, but uh, it's a, I own it like a townhome uh, type ownership with a garage in the back and I live mostly upstairs, but maybe the kitchen and the living rooms on the first floor facing a nice garden in the back. So right now that back of those buildings is really nasty. So that would be a high priority to work with the city, to clean that up. Uh, and then just open up those storefronts, uh, get some fresh paint. Don't paint the fair. We don't know what it means, but we love that paint on the upper floor of that building. So. That's really cool. Yeah. That's it for Lone Tree. <clears throat> All right, let's move down the road to Oxford. I've never been in Oxford before. So uh, when I drove to town, the first thing I thought was, wow, these buildings are spectacular. Has everyone been to Oxford here? Uh, amazing, amazing downtown buildings. Uh, some of the best I've seen in the state for a community that size. Uh, they look like they're in decent shape structurally. I mean, you don't know for sure. Um, but most of them need some, some love, too. Most of them need some paint, a little tuck pointing, some, some minor improvements, uh, but just fantastic buildings. Uh, I think a priority, I think it's the biggest strength that Oxford has from what I, what I saw. Um, also, there is a, a core of nice destination businesses, uh, coffee shop, boutique, antiques, etc. Um, I came and took pictures on a Tuesday. We were in Oxford on Tuesday also. I guess it was the same day, Tuesday. Um, I don't think there was a business open during my time there. And I did, you know, it's kind of a weekend destination to, to get the stores open. Uh, but the business look sharp. I want to get in. I'm coming back to the antique store because I saw stuff in the windows. Um, another strength is the uh, elementary school, very close to the downtown. Um, and then um, I want to say something about events too for, for all the communities. Usually when we do visits like this, um, we're talking a lot more about events because they're really important in small towns. People are looking for something to do. You don't have a movie theater. You don't have the symphony. You know, you, you don't have a lot of those things that, that bigger towns have. So smaller events are usually very important. But we were we were excited about the event schedules in, in these towns. I, it's, you can always use another one, you know, more is better with events. 
Um, but uh, you do a good job with events and some unique ones too. I tried to find a uh, student Baker Days photo online for Oxford. Um, but I don't know if that's Oxford or not. But I, what's that? Studebaker Days is brand, a brand oh, it's new. Oh, it's brand new, so there wouldn't be any photos. That's a good point. Okay. <laughs> Next time I do a show, I'll get a picture of a monster. But we thought that was a very unique, very specific kind of event. You know, and Fourth of July, a lot of the communities do a Fourth of July. Uh, Light Up Oxford sounds very su successful, too. So the events that you have going on are, are, are very good. And then I think Chris has got some strikes, too. Maybe you do. Yeah. Yeah, we couldn't fit them all on one slide, right? You have 10 upper story units that are, that are inhabited right now, which is outstanding for the size that you are. And um, the front of this building is fabulous. I really wanted to see that apartment. Um, the city council person has said it was really, really intriguing inside. You have such a cute little library there, that library nugget um, to service that area. Um, Augusta Hall as an event space for those small artistic um, activities it was very nice. We did not get to go inside that. Um, you have a housing ordinance. So you have the ability to keep that residential off the first floor in the front of your housing. So kudos, you're a step ahead, right? Now, you know, partner with the county so then you can have that en enforcement piece come in and help you maintain or uh, change use. If you have somebody in uh, a lower floor right now, you're able to actually, once they leave, turn that back into retail. Because once it is residential, it's very hard um, to, to get it out of that. And you have a great destination location. <laughs> totally agree with Jim. Those buildings are fabulous. Each of them is so unique. And you're already working on a comprehensive plan with care. So that's another step in the right right direction and you have 80 acres i believe 80 acres um zone land ready for more development <coughs> um, so again lots of potential for growth this one the structure or oh, oh okay bounce it back and forth all right um <coughs> So we're getting right into the recommendations here. And you know, I'm the organization guy. He talked about this with the uh, common uh, challenges communities have. And it was certainly the case for Oxford too. Um, I don't know when it was, several years ago, a, a visioning committee started up in Oxford. Usually you think of a visioning committee as a, as a group that, uh, that says, what do we want Oxford to be 20 years from now? And you kind of work towards that. Now, somehow that visioning committee has morphed into an events committee. And maybe that was the maybe that was the need back then when they were talking. I think that's great. That's okay. That's their that's their realm. They're doing the, the events right now. Um, but um, it probably doesn't help you comprehensively. You don't, you don't have another community group of some kind other than that events group in the city that's actually making community development plans and, <clears throat> and trying to uh, um, do uh, do group projects. In the downtown in the community so as i said before um put together a group um we would call it uh, some kind of a betterment committee to get sarah involved in a big way to help us sarah's a skilled facilitator uh, but um recruit volunteers prioritize and then work on an implementation plan um, I would see a 5A person steering committee for that. Prioritize your goals, be specific. You, you, you remember what I um, said that Hills did with their um, um, hometown pride group, and then go to work. And I just threw kind of a sample org chart in here that might be even too small for your structure. And I, I, I'm not recommending those action teams. I just wanted to give you an example. Maybe there's a building improvements action team. Maybe there's a downtown maintenance group. Uh, maybe a business marketing group to market those those cool stores that you have in downtown Oxford. But I think something like this could really help you build some capacity and get projects done in the community. And then um, the only other um, recommendation I would make before Chris closes out Oxford, I, I wanted to key on the building rehabilitation. I said that is the community strength, but there's some, there's some work to do there. Um, several downtown buildings need help. Uh, some of them are simple maintenance jobs. Others look like they're larger scale rehab 
um, projects. Uh, but as Jim said, and I said before, you really have to use a combination of local, state, and federal programs to match appropriate buildings and local ordinance to avoid problem buildings. I, I think our goal for Oxford, we would love, love to see a set of goal of, of, of an improvement to one downtown building a year for a number of years. And we mentioned the catalyst um, program <coughs> too that Jim administers. Um, we think Oxford is a prime candidate for a catalyst project. I think they, they did apply one year, um, but we want them to come back. We want to get one done and maybe this thing can domino throughout the downtown area. But the catalyst grants are $100,000 grant. The city is the applicant. It's an annual competition. It's for underutilized buildings. So if you've got a vacant building and a use for it ready, that, that's the perfect kind of project for us. I think a 90% of the projects that we do are for story housing. Um, sometimes we get one story buildings where that's not necessary, um, but building use and the quality of the rehab are both very important when we're storing this, these things. Uh, we try to get the information out early. We do application workshops, but I'm hoping that Oxford can take advantage of this program. Um, another program that we have that we do not manage, but it's in our um, agency, is called the Downtown Revitalization Fund. Uh, this is a federal funding. It's a uh, community development block grant funding uh, for, for, for facade rehabs. Now, if you take a look at this program, you might get sticker shocked because this, this is a big grant. Um, communities can receive up to a half a million dollars to do several facades, just the facades. And I think if it's a corner building, you can do the side to side. I think they're doing the count roofs as facades now too. But it's something to look into. Um, as I said, up to half a million dollars. Um, Jim and I weren't sure. I, we think that communities under a thousand, you can get less money for that. And they, it used to be three hundred thousand, but we're going to check on that when we get back to the office. Um, Typically, a rule of thumb for this grant program is half of the funding comes from us, the state, and then the owner and a local funding um, close the gaps. Maybe the local, local owner is in it for 25%, and then maybe the city or the county is in it for 25% too. But uh, you've got so many great facades, so many that need work, that it, it's kind of a logical thing to look at, CDBG program. Um, there's also another program um, that we're going to send you information on. It's another community development block grant program um, that just deals with upper story housing. So we will send you the information on that too. And um, feel free to get people to Oxford to talk about these programs in more detail. We'll come. I got to go back and pick up Andy's anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> Also, um, some other recommendations. Oftentimes, communities put together facade grant programs. Oh, I would love these county people. I would love to have a county facade program that cities matched. And that would be so cool if we could pull something like that off. Um, we often see um, communities put together smaller local grant programs that are specific to building elements, such as some communities would just have sign grants to improve that down and signage. Um, Esterville, Iowa has a grant program to take, to uncover upper story windows. They had a problem with boarded up windows. So they increased the transparency of the building by uh, starting a grant program just to under, uh, uh, uncover those. Knoxville had a lot of metal in their downtown. They started a program to take the, the false facade, metal facades down. Really cool projects. And sometimes just a little bit of money can leverage projects. I mean, if you got a goal in Oxford of one project a year, you know, maybe you've got a grant program of 2,000 and you do a couple of grants a year just to, to get a thousand dollar grant away to lever leverage bigger projects. More is always better, but uh, sometimes you have to small, start small. And I mentioned countywide also. <clears throat> And then I'm not going to talk too much about this, um, but um, we talk a lot about incentives, uh, but we do have a lot of our communities doing a good job with ordinances too. I mean, if you get uh, if you get problem buildings, derelict buildings, uh, buildings that are causing safety issues with bricks falling off too, you can enforce local 
minimum, minimum maintenance or nuisance ordinances. And we're going to show you some examples of those. Um, we're going to give you a handout too that we put together. It's kind of a one pager on uh, uh, addressing problem properties in downtown districts. And there are some links to local uh, ordinances for this too. We're even seeing small towns put these ordinances together too. So they've been very proactive. Oh, that didn't look like mine. It scared me. Oh, oh no. So here's Chris. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, talking about those little things that make a big impact, and it really dovetails from what Jim was talking about with the facade pieces. Um, it's hard to see on these slides because you're so far away, but it's just little paint. You know, small things, just painting the wood trim on this building, the size of tub cleaning, you know, that hopefully can happen soon. <coughs> that would look incredible. Just freshening that up, a fresh coat of paint, sparkling windows. That was one thing that we did notice. Um, was so many of the windows really could use just a good little washing. Um, have a party. We had talked about this in Fort Dodge. Let's have a party where we wash the street and wash the buildings and wash the windows and get the whole community involved in helping those business owners out, especially the ones that are not open very often. If they're only in their store once a week, they're not going to have time to wash those windows. But it really speaks about that time and place to have those fresh, clean windows. Uh, clean and tidy. I did note again those trash cans is something we all have missed. Uh, finding a way to, to hide those, um, whether there's something you can put in front of them. Yes, moving them is not an option. Just sewing some of those little things that could be spruced up a little bit. Um, but just again, little you know, little things make a big impact. Flowers. Um, benches outside those businesses, even in the weather like it is now. We can sit out on a bench today, especially yesterday when it was warmer. And Chris, the, uh, if you go back to the slide, that, that black, uh, white building with the black trim is just one example. We have several buildings in your downtown that have done a nice job. Uh, so uh, good to throw them, you know, right. amen, keep it up. Uh, and really attention to detail. They had uh, 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 street address and what's inside. Mm -hmm. That might have even had one of them where at the business hours, which we really, that's really important, especially if you're only open on Friday and Saturday uh, of the week. So um, don't want these good ones to be drugged down by, the, by their neighbors. Definitely. And um, like, again, I came from Sheraton. So we did one building. Uh, we did the facade with UTR too, but we did one building and then the neighbor goes, oh, my building doesn't look very good. Now I have to boost my game, right? And so it just took off peer pressure, right? <laughs> Any stage of the game um, can be a good thing in a small community. And then when can I shop? So Robin and I ran back into the building in City Hall to get our wallets and we could go spend some money and nobody was open. Uh, you know, and I understand the coffee shop was doing some maintenance. That was a bummer because I could have used some coffee that afternoon. So these are just some really simple kinds of signs. Make sure we know when you're open. Make sure that like if Jim wants to come back, he knows that that store is going to be open on Saturday. So he doesn't drive two hours and they're not open. Um, again, making sure that you're using social media, both at the county, the city, and then your, your business owners are really pushing social media because that's how most of us keep in touch with the places that we um, shop at. It doesn't have to be sophisticated. Open uh, open sign, our sign can be just chalk, right? Chalk on a chalkboard in the window. So we still know when you're gonna be open. And then know your buildings. These are just some templates of a downtown inventory. So you know who owns the building when it was built, um, what, what kind of heating it has inside of it. I come from the main street world, so everything is documented. If it's not documented, it does not exist. So um, pretty simple form. And then the other one is for a business. So you can make sure you always are keeping track of who owns that business. As we went through all the communities, we heard, well, we don't, we're not sure who's owning that business right now or what their phone number is. So if you have that, and you have a group come in, not necessarily like us, but even like if there's a small, you know, family vacation kind of people, you can look those phone numbers up for them. So very, very important that you know what you have because that's what you're going to build everything else on. You need to be very realistic on what you have, what your assets are, 
and how you can make the most of those. Again, those simple things. Dennis. Yeah. So we talked about uh, doing a drawing of the uh, the lady who owns like the three buildings at the north end of town. Uh, but we thought this building was one that was an example. It's on a side street, actually. I think this is actually called Main Street. Um, and uh, it's an at-risk building. So we wanted to show a picture and wanted to point out if you've got an at-risk, there's always like so many buildings, what do I do? Well, if you got an at-risk building, it's going to fall down or catch fire or someone's in the process of maybe doing an inappropriate rehab, you need to proactively get in there and, and make sure you manage it. So this is an example. Uh, it makes me nervous from what I saw was happening to the building. Uh, how can the city proactively meet with this owner and talk about some incentives that help them do the right thing that's a positive to the neighborhood? Uh, also, there's a vacant lot to the west of that building. Uh, and affordable housing is very hard to deliver in these towns. Um, we see some bad examples of, of affordable housing that's that actually devalues the, the property, both that it's on as well as the neighbors. This is just a very simple stick built house. It's 22 feet wide. There's economies of scale there. Uh, you have less roof, you have less structure to deal with. Uh, give me a front porch, nine foot front porch so I can actually use it and see my neighbors and enjoy it. Uh, and don't worry about the garage. Uh, that can happen in the alley or you can park in the street. That's a way to deliver affordable housing. Uh, that's next to your downtown. And then on the right, you see a green cube. It's a, it's a one strategy to deal with the uh, trash cans. So a lot of Oxford doesn't have alleys. And yeah, I think Lone Tree as well doesn't maybe have alleys in some spots. Uh, and so if we can put these little enclosures on the side streets, right where we have a bump out, where we have maybe a shade tree and some plantings, it kind of softens it up visually. Uh, my past two houses, I had to walk about 50 or 60 feet from the back door to where I put the trash because it was an alley back there or a detached garage. That's no different than asking these people to walk down the stairs and walk 50 or 60 feet to a side street and put their trash in a uh, community uh, trash uh, container that's screened. So uh, think about that as a strategy. Whoever's up next. <laughs> And when you see the report, that little middle gray building, that's a L-shaped access. Uh, and so how do you enliven these little spaces? I put a little privacy fence, uh, some flowers, a, a bright lights. Uh, think about these little spaces uh, that don't get any love that suddenly make the adjacent buildings more valuable as well as the building they're attached to. All right, moving on to our friends in Swisher. Um, just some of the highlights that we really saw there. Um, one of the first communities that we went to that we saw good wayfinding signage like when we were coming in on the highway it was like here's downtown here's there was no question of oh gosh where do i turn um because in many of your downtowns if i'm just on the highway i'm not going to find downtown so tell me how to get there um you also have some very new businesses but you also have some legacy businesses that have been in that community operating for almost 100 years and so that is such a strength that we that you really want to celebrate you also have engaged business owners. Um, many of your business owners were at our meeting, which tells us you care. They're not just, you know, saying, well, I'm, I'm, I don't need to go hear what these people have to say, and that's super important. Um, we heard that the park and rec program is knocking it out of the park. That is so important when we have in our small rural communities. As many of my colleagues have mentioned, there's, there's a lot to do in your communities. But providing these things for your families, because most of the families want to live in your small towns. They want that quiet. They want they want a good, safe place to raise their kids. So hats off to you for whatever you're doing um, to make your park and rec programming really strong. Um, we heard about the Swishers Men's Club. We didn't see any of those men. Maybe they're out doing lots of work, but um, or but we heard they're there doing things. So so that's good. Um, and again, as we mentioned before, these were just some of the community events that are happening in this little community. Um, Swisher Fun Days, there's a car show, there's a farmer's market, there's a Live Aid Christmas Parade, and Easter Brunch is on, and that's not even everything that was on the list that they gave us. So hats off to you guys for, for what you're doing there. Um, again, a few more of the strengths. Um, the businesses in this community are really pulling people into the community. The business owners told us about 75% of their business core is coming from outside the community. 
they are bringing dollars into that community and they're not relying on just the people that are living within that community. Um, so that is super important and should be celebrated. Um, because of the business mix that they have there, um, it's active during the day, in the morning, it's, it's at night, they've got things happening on the weekend. So you've constantly got people coming in and out and use, utilizing your district, which again is super important. Um, all of your communities um, are similar in that you have a great location. Sometimes being this close to Iowa City can be um, a detriment, but it's also an asset for all of you. you your great locations, you have a creative corridor, you're close to I-80, 380. So you've got this opportunity to pull people off the interstates if we can get them there. Um, another strength that was that is starting to happen in Swisher that we heard about is that it's kind of starting to be have a niche market of wedding venues. So there are some wedding venues close, and then there are people coming in and utilizing the businesses in the community when they're there for a wedding. Um, building on those niches is super important um, for as long as that as that trend is um, there. We want to make sure that we do that. And then we also heard about that you guys have worked really hard on um, creating the Swisher Action Committee, and they've been working with Sarah, and they've they're organized and they have bylaws. So kind of what Jim and some of the others were saying, get that local grassroots organization going there, and these guys are already um, a little ahead of that. All right, so let's let's talk about some of the challenges that we heard about. Um, we heard that there are some ordinances in the city that are not business friendly. No matter the size of your community, it is so important that we are supporting the businesses that we have. Because once they go, it's gonna be hard to get somebody to come back in. So you really need to be thinking about, uh, do we have old ordinances on our books that were maybe important in the 30s, 40s, and 50s? We see some communities that have not updated ordinances since those times, we're in a different world now. So make sure you're looking at your ordinances and making sure that it's supporting the businesses that you have, that it's friendly. Um, the city water service, that's the elephant in the room that we are not gonna address. You all know what you've gotta, well, we don't know what the answer is there, but we know that's something that you're gonna have to continue to work on. Um, business succession concerns were another thing that we heard about, and I hear this from almost every community that we work in in the state. And I do a lot of counseling on business succession. I have been through um, a, a family business succession on uh, transferring that business to someone else. But in every one of our communities, we need to think about those businesses that we have that we do not want to lose. And we can't just sit back and go, well, gosh, we hope something happens. We've got to be proactive in trying to help maintain those businesses and transfer them to a new generation, if, that, if at all possible. Um, the railroad property is um, kind of disconnects and breaks your um, your downtown kind of in half. Um, it's visually distracting. Um, it's a challenge for pedestrians to get from a great business down here to a great business down here. And all of your towns probably have something like that. Um, and again, but specifically here in Swisher, it seems to just kind of cut downtown in half. And we've got some ideas on things that you can maybe do to improve that. So moving on to recommendations. First of all, not just for Swisher, but for all of you guys, build on your strengths. Build up on those strengths that you have and that we've talked about today. Um, one of the things that they do in Swisher that I just think is phenomenal is their boutique bus crawl. So folks, correct me if I'm talking about that, but what could be better than putting about 60 women on a bus with credit cards and dropping them off at businesses. I would love that. I have so much told me hate it. Uh, but I am a business specialist and I can continually tell him it is my job to make economic impact wherever I land, <laughs> which sometimes means the credit card comes out a lot. But what a, what a way to do that. You're moving people not just to their community, but to neighboring communities too. So there's a lot of opportunity here for you guys to work together and to do that. If that bus isn't stopping in your community, you need to talk to them and you need to figure out what businesses does that bus need to stop at and how many times a year can you do that quarterly or, or whatever. That's a phenomenal idea. Um, they're doing a good job of cross promoting with each other, but I always recommend that to every business that I work in. When you check out a customer in your business, are you telling them, hey, you should go check out XYZ. They're right next door. They're great. If you haven't been there, you should do it. Um, or asking people, what brought you out today? Oh, you're here for whatever. Did you know, do you need coffee? Like, we have a great coffee place over here. Constantly be sending them to somebody else in your community. It is your job. The longer you keep us there, the longer we linger, the more money we spend. <laughs> Every study shows you that. My credit card records show that. I am the first case that I will show you. The longer we stay, you have more opportunity to get that money out of our wallet. 
Um, again, this wedding niche market that's happening there, uh, continue to kind of build on that. Right now, we are seeing a lot of destination businesses or destination weddings. People don't, they want to go somewhere unique. And if you've got a florist, you've got a place to stay. If you've got a place for the party bus, I mean, the party bus is going to stop at the squirrel tap and, oh my gosh, you know, work that out. Figure out how you keep them there and when they're coming into your community for whatever that niche may be. And all of you probably have something that's a little unique there. Um, again, that Swisher Action Committee is off and going. Continue to, to, to move that um, group forward. Um, all of us have kind of touched on city ordinances, and we think all of you have an opportunity to review or, your ordinances. Look at things that are there. Do you need a, a vacant building registry? Um, in Swisher, there's an a ordinance that has something to do with side yards, and buildings can't touch each other. And it's time to look at some of these things and go, okay, this is not practical for where we are today in our business community and make some of those changes. Again, parking requirements. Many communities now are, are loosening their parking requirements based on housing or, you know, a, a, a business doesn't necessarily in a small town need 20 parking spots, depending on what type of business you are. So again, look at those and really think about what can we update, what's practical, what's outdated. And if you, um, we're hoping that all of you interact with the Iowa League of Cities, they are a fabulous resource. If you're not doing that, make sure you're reaching out to them. They offer training guidance, and all kinds of great examples. Um, you've heard a lot about our Catalyst Building application, but we think this building could be a great um, um, opportunity for that, and Dennis is going to so show you an example in a minute. Again, um, Jimmy T here is your guy. Call us and talk to us when you have ideas and you want to talk something through. Call us before you submitted the application and you didn't get the money, and then you're like, well, what didn't work? Talk to us. We are here to help you. We don't score those grants. Jim doesn't score them. He can offer you um, ideas and, and ways to, to maybe have a better um, application. But really focus on one downtown building that, that gives that vision to people. In many of our communities, we have people that, that don't see the vision. We do have some visionaries, but sometimes we need to show people a good example. And this is a great opportunity, a great program to kind of help that set the example of, of what you think, what you want your community and your downtown to look like. And again, this is going to be a slide that's going to be very hard for you guys to see, but we did some work with a consultant uh, several years ago that looked at the cost of a vacant building in Iowa using Iowa figures. So this is what we lose in our communities when a building sits vacant. We lose workers that might be working in that business and, and the, the, their payroll taxes that they pay, the money they would spend if they're an employer in your district. Um, if we're a business and we're, we're doing, if there's a business operating in that business, they're probably paying for accounting services, insurance, and um, other professional services. You lose that. If there's a business operating in, in a building, they're paying for your city water, they're paying for electricity. If those buildings are vacant and shuttered, all of that is shut off and everybody loses that revenue. So um, it's really important that we keep those businesses and those buildings operating not just for the building, but for what it does to our local economy. And we have another slide, which I didn't include here, that talks about the value of an upper story apartment when someone lives in your downtown using Iowa figures. And our figures are a little dated, so I think this number is probably a little higher now. But we estimate that they spend about $20,000 a year into the local economy, one bedroom apartment. So think about that, do the math. Let's say you have five apartments that are could be activated in your downtown. That's an extra fifty thousand dollars, or that's coming. No, a hundred thousand dollars that's coming into your, into your downtown in your district. So the ripple effect of those dollars really, really does have an impact. Right. So, yes, this is the white building on the corner, um, and uh, we love the opportunity. Maybe just an idea. We were leveraging the fact that there's an Airbnb in the building just to the east that uh, caters to uh, emphasizes uh, wedding parties to. to use it. This might be the male version of the uh, wedding party renting an uh, Airbnb in the upper floor of this, this building. But it could be apartments, could be lots of different types of residential on the top. On the right of that building, you see, uh, it looks like there's probably a sleeping porch. And so I uh, converted it back to its original use as an outdoor space. Uh, that's a four season outdoor space on the second floor. Uh, otherwise, pulling the siding off, uh, the brick behind there is probably not that great. There's probably not a lot of detail left. That's probably why it was boarded up. 
but at least get the siding off. Uh, you, this may be one of those rare cases where you tuck point and paint it uh, and paint it white since people know it as a white building, but open up the storefront windows on the first floor, open up the transoms, make sure there's good lighting. Uh, you see the, there's a carnation and there's a the tagline that says, we're having fun in Swisher. Uh, think of photo opportunities whenever you're visiting your downtown, where are they gonna take the picture? Uh, I would walk down the street just to get the, you know, the groomsmen standing there getting a picture taken in front of the flower. And then that vacant lot, it's another one. It's going to be a nice uh, development site sometime in the future, maybe five years, maybe 10, 20 years. Uh, but let it, while it's ripening, uh, use it for something else. And so uh, food trucks could be going on there, as well as the uh, pop-up temporary wood structures that we talked about. And it also could be a place for some overflow parking that you, you could use in this part of that town. Um, a couple others. We talked about business succession. Um, again, this is happening in every community across the state, and we really want to be proactive. Um, what we heard there is that the grocery store is probably looking to retire. I think the owner's 91. It's time for him. I thought for me, I'd be wanting to put my feet up a little bit. Um, but again, how can we be proactive and what can we do to assist these folks? Um, can we assist with marketing their businesses? Can we help them with getting them with somebody that can help them determine what is their business worth? Do they want to sell the business and the building and all those sorts of things? So we have some resources in our office. Um, Advance Iowa, which is located at the University of Northern Iowa, has some great resources to help transition family-owned businesses and other businesses. So there are some things out there. And then identify what gaps are in the marketplace. So if, if we're not going to get a grocery store back, what would be a good thing that would feed that market that could use that building and still serve the community well? So let's really be thinking about that. And then we know that the, the wonderful cafe where we had lunch, they're looking to retire too. So again, because those are the key landmark businesses that we don't want to lose. So think about them as, look at your downtown as, who are your tenants? Who do you not and how are you going to be proactive to keep those spaces active and filled and serving your community? Um, just a couple of ideas. We talked about the vacant lots and the under, underutilized buildings. So it does create that disconnect, both visually and from a safety standpoint, especially when you're trying to get over the, the railroad tracks. There's no sidewalk there, so you're walking in the street. Um, so again, how can we screen and improve these properties so that you don't have control? Maybe people aren't talking to them. We all have that grumpy business owner who's like, don't talk to me, don't touch my land. You know, so, but how do we, how do we deal with that? So here's a, a couple of ideas. Um, our wonderful design friend, Dennis, this is actually a parking lot in the East Village in downtown Point. But we didn't want to just see an ugly parking lot, so you can explain better yeah, how this was They created. actually asked me to tell them which shrubs they should plant to hide the parking. And I said, we can do better than that. So I went to industrial salvage yards and found these pieces and that's uh, Metro Waste Recycling, that's their headquarters. So these pieces speak to their mission. It's an art piece, people take their pictures. It's a big selfie location uh, and uh, promotes the art. And the, the mural and these other things as well. And you had a great idea of uh, painting the pavement. If we don't have sidewalks, at least let's put some bright colored paint on the, side, on the pavement between the restaurant and the east and what we hope to be a cool white building on the west and link them with this pattern. Something the similar to what we all saw during the pandemic, little things on the side, can you just paint colorful polka dots that are gonna lead you from one place to the next over the, and we're looking at that and we tend to ignore, you know, you can still see the cars through here, but you really don't notice it anymore because it looks so fun and so bright. Um, this is just another idea that was, I believe from our friends here in Iowa City, this is simply chain link fence and they gave people colored plastic strips to tie on the chain link fence. It's colorful, it's bright. You can easily take it down and move it if you need to, but it distracts from whatever is on the other side that you really don't want people to see. My guess is maybe this was during a construction project or something, I'm not for sure, but it was just so vibrant when I found it online. Um, we just did a, a downtown assessment similar to our visit here in um, Webster City. This was a, a downtown building that they had that, again, the building owner doesn't maintain it. Everybody here is grumpy, but they had Rag Rag coming to town um, last summer. So they didn't have enough money to do the entire mural. So this will be a phased mural, but eventually this building will have all four seasons. 
on the um, mural, but they got the first section done last summer when Rag Bride was there. And again, as Dennis said, these places become selfie stations where everybody takes their picture. The, the one downfall is I would make sure if I'm doing something like that, my town name is on it. So that when the selfie goes out, everybody knows, oh, I'm in whatever town I'm in. Um, let the power of social media become a marketing and branding tool for your communities. So find ways to do that. Um, and then just a couple more, we talked about the roadways and the crosswalk paintings. Um, sometimes you see the little Burma shape sign. So is there a way to do that to get somebody from one place to another past the disconnect? Um, this is from the small community of Clarence, Iowa on Highway 30. Again, they had a building that was really unsightly with an ugly parking lot. And they simply bought some of these big cattle watering bins. They put their logo on them, their town logo, and they plant them. In the summer, they look great with the flowers in them. Again, they can move them if they need to. They're not permanent structures. This is what it looks like in Easter time because flowers aren't going to go yet, but they put... Easter eggs and other little things in there. Again, it brightens it up and it helps you not see what's ugly behind. And then they also did some crosswalk um, paintings like Dennis and I were mentioning. Um, they are on the Lincoln Highway and so they use the logo from the Lincoln Highway which speaks to their community. Just paint and volunteers um, that made that happen for them. All right, and last but not least, our friends in Tiffin. Our fifth town, Tiffin. Um, I've done this a long, long time. And I earned every gray hair that I have. And I've never had five more different towns than what we had on this visit. But it was fun going to Tiffin. And I think about the dynamic community that exists there. And it, it all revolves around their housing developments, the pride in the schools. Boy, the expansion that we saw there had a, had a really nice driving tour. Uh, they're getting close on their water plant, plant capacity. The rec facilities are wonderful. Uh, the rec fest that they talked about, um, trail connections, and trying, please tell me the name of the county park they're trying to reach. Yeah. Camp Park. It's like, that's fantastic. You know, all the things that we would say, we put them in a hat and we toss them up in the air, and which things would we like to have to have a very dynamic community? And the one thing they don't have is a downtown. Okay? <laughs> but they've acquired all that property, and so they're working toward that. So I got to warn you, this section is going to look a little different than the other four, okay? So it's got to start with trying to get everybody as close as possible on the same page. Now, I said I've been doing this a long time. So 20 years ago, I had very, very similar conversations with West Des Moines trying to figure out how do we be a small city government that's now urban, okay? That's how I feel a little bit about Tiffin. I think they said in 1990 there was 400 people. 460. 460, thank you. And it was like, holy smokes, think about that. And in 2030, did you say 20,000? Uh, 10 to 12. Oh, okay, 10 to 12. <laughs> I like bigger numbers, <laughs> but it's like, it's grown like crazy. So having a vision, getting everybody on the same page, that is critical. So we believe that a downtown overlay has to be the, the vehicle going forward. Um, we saw a really um, dynamic video that they showed us on on what's likely to happen. Here's the challenge with that video, is it created a tribute area, green space, that um, would develop a downtown meeting space. But downtown is not as dynamic when it doesn't have two-sided economic development opportunities. So when you're in a community and you walk down Main Street and there are businesses lined on both sides, really gives you that many more opportunities to try to figure out. So the economic development expectations have to be more than green space meeting space, 
Okay, it has to, it has to include that, but it's got to be more than that. And the design criteria has to include what do we want. So we talked a lot when we were there about where can we put that bar and can we keep the expectations high and don't lower that bar for developers. They're going to push you to lower that. Absolutely don't give in to developers. You have prime opportunities with a new downtown. Don't give in. And we've talked about parking in a lot of the towns. Uh, this is one that I, yes, you have to pay attention to parking, but don't let parking rule what happens from an economic development standpoint. Um, I do really big projects. I just helped with one, a conversion of 274 units in Lee Summit, Missouri. And they said, parking, we're not gonna require a car for every unit. Think about that from a planning standpoint. It's because people that live and work, it's adjacent to their downtown, they don't even own cars. So as we have an opportunity in a place like this, what if there's shared car opportunities? Or what if they're working in the school system and could ride their bike? I, I just had dinner with a friend of mine and his son in Grinnell, and he moved back from Asia to teach in Grinnell. And he said, um, I'm teaching at the high school and I can ride my bike. I don't have, I can borrow my mom and dad's car if I have to. I don't, because I can ride my bike. So don't let parking rule what happens there and keep your standards high. Dennis then really worked on, put, put your hat on, don't let your mind blow off here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, I'll stand on the side and I'll help yeah. from the side. So there's, uh, <laughs> I took the good work you've done in terms of land acquisition and some and the starting as a starting point and tried to apply some urban design uh, principles to it that I think you would really see uh, success in terms of that path. Uh, double loaded retail uh, is one place, and so certainly uh, as you come in on Main Street off of Highway Six, this double sided retail is really important. But I also brought it down south of Third Street, so you really have the four corners, which is the classic downtown. Uh, scenario uh, with retail on the first floor, but residential on the upper floors. The um, other principle then is, of course, and you, you've been, your drawings have been showing this, is street parking, very important. Uh, angle parking in front of the commercial, but parallel parking when it's in front of the uh, park, because we don't want so much of cars to dominate that experience. And then the remainder of the parking uh, being in the back off of alleys, and you can create these alleys, and they're all linked uh, so that it's easy to circulate and find a spot. So rear parking easily found that triggers either breaks in the city block where you can get from the parking to the front of the buildings uh, or uh, uh, double loaded uh, retail, which is harder to, to manage. The third aspect, which I wound up putting development within this uh, square city block area. It's a pretty big block for one. I think it was like 350 feet, uh, so a little large. One was to create this four square. Two was our downtown open spaces. If you really look at historically successful downtown open spaces, they're typically only about 100 feet across. And the rule of thumb there that drives that is said uh, at 100 feet, which is about here to the hotel, I can see a person and recognize that person and go, hey, and meet them halfway. I can see the business, I can see the storefront and see that they sell shirts over there. And so it creates a real dynamic. More than 100 feet, uh, it becomes a little scary. I don't interact, I don't use the whole space. So this is 100 feet wide by about 150. Uh, and then it flows into these other spaces uh, that allow for larger activities. You've got some huge uh, uh, mature trees I'd love to see you save. And maybe as you get further into the residential neighborhood, it becomes uh, programmatically more uh, passive, uh, nature-driven type experience. Uh, here's a wild idea. I've actually done this in Memphis, so it's doable. 
the fire station. We'd love to get the fire station out of there. Uh, it's a really a it's not a downtown function. It's a perimeter function given all the big trucks and what they do. Uh, this says keep the roof, keep the structure, holds the roof on, but take all the walls out. Uh, maybe keep the bathrooms and utilities there so you can have a, a bathroom that serves a park. But now you have a, a roof over a paved area that you can have a, a, a sport court type things. You could also then have a nice stage in there uh, that has a hose down, holds the, holds the sound in and have lighting effects and speakers and create a, an outdoor performance space that is protected from the weather. The uh, Veterans Memorial, um, wanted to find a space that was a little bit more sacred, a little more meditative. And so this space here in the corner, right size it, maybe the old city hall can be used as an indoor memorial as well for the vets, as well as the outdoor uh, space that has a well-defined. And then this area here and this area here, that's residential. And again, really important for, a, for an urban park that's gonna be your downtown park to have eyes on it that makes it feel safe and activates it. So these are two or three story apartments, walk-ups. They have a, a, a door a entrance on the first level, a little porch, they sit there and they're engaging the park. What a great place to live. Uh, and then these are little cottages, three plexes and a duplex, uh, but they're broken up so they feel like individual cottages. They're served by an alley in the back with a garage. Again, they have little porches that faces the park activated. Uh, I would love to have one of these units and sit here and engage people and, and be a part of it. Our thought behind that too was the transition between the historic neighborhood districts and then into this new downtown district. So it blends in and it kind of yeah. walks you down a path to the commercial <clears throat> development area. Yeah, yeah. I think of the Friday. Your commercial is, a, is the most dense and then the next dense and then the least dense is your existing uh, single family residential. This alley, by the way, is a great asset and brings you right into the heart of it. Uh, a, a strong uh, uh, retail commercial piece right on Highway 6 is the gateway. And you thought that made me a hotel uh, option, which would be really striking to have a small uh, hotel that would serve your downtown. We're seeing a lot of destination hotels pop up in more urban centers. And if there was a way to do a, a 20 or 24 room um, destination, um, hotel here, boutique hotel. Um, again, we're not trying to dictate that developers have to do these things, but we're also not saying start with an incentive. We're saying start with your design and your plan and then create the incentives when you find something that you really want. So it's a, it's a lot different than kind of where you're at right now, but think about, is there a shift there of the things you can use that inspire it? You know, this is about an hour and a half worth of work after a day of visits, so, you know, uh, it's a start, but, but give, it, give it a chance. We're going to end with Robin. All right, so yes, I know you've all been sitting there. We have given you a lot of information, and maybe it feels like, wow. Um, but these are just some opportunities that we thought, after visiting all five communities, that you have an opportunity to work together. Um, one thing we learned is that we have people traveling with us, and even some of the supervisors are like, oh my god, I've never been in this town, I've never even been in that, I didn't even know this store was here. So is there an opportunity to maybe create some kind of a quarterly rural newsletter that is very simple that you can just use to share the festivals and events that are happening in, in your communities, so that you're not scheduling, um, that you're all not scheduling your festival on the same day, that we can support each other and we can get from place to place. Um, it could be an opportunity for you to market the available properties that you have in your district. Um, maybe there's somebody that's looking for a second location. Um, you can celebrate your successes. Um, we learned in some of the businesses, we saw this rural road trip um, flyer or poster that was in it. So we know that's another opportunity that's some things that are organized that are bringing people from place to place to place to shop. And so um, just how can we enhance that communication, but yet every community can have a little section of this um, to um, talk about their own community. This might be something Sarah's group can help you with. Again, start small. Maybe you just start doing it twice a year, quarterly. Um, everybody provides their own information. And then again, um, 
We cannot echo how impressed we have been with the engagement from your county supervisors. Uh, many of us have done numerous visits like this and have never had this kind of engagement. So um, I think they just deserve a round of applause or whatever. But, uh, being engaged. Um, so there are some opportunities, we think, to do some kind of countywide building incentives. Um, as you heard us mention, maybe the county can put in some money that, that the city is going to be required to match in order to get that money to have projects happening in your rural areas. Um, build those partnerships with each city. Um, the county does have building inspection personnel, um, and they can help you in your communities if you're having a hard time enforcing those ordinances. We heard in several communities, well, yeah, we have an ordinance, but we don't enforce it. Well, that doesn't do anybody any good. Um, and it's never fun to be the bad guy. Um, see if you can work with the county to help them move that forward for you. And then um, let them be the bad guy is kind of what I'm saying. Okay, we'll just throw it out. <laughs> but, uh, but that was one thing that they said, hey, we think we can help with that. Um, and then are there some opportunities to do some countywide code enforcement that is the same for everybody? So again, it builds that consistency across the county for like safety issues and, and just some of the, the things that you're seeing that you're dealing with. Um, but again, thank you to all of you. Um, we did feel very welcome in every community that we were in. There's a lot of great stuff happening here. Um, this is all of our contact information. Um, if you need to get a hold of us, but um, I think we've got just a little bit of time. If there are any questions or comments, um, we'd be happy to, to take those. Robin, one, one thing I wanted to mention too, we talked a lot about the street state pedestrian experience. And in June, I don't have the dates, in June, we're doing downtown forums in four locations around the state. And our headline speaker is our own Dennis Reynolds, um, talking about uh, di different ideas and We'll have discussions on how to fund things like that. Uh, uh, but, uh, the importance of the downtown experience and yeah. what makes an experience successful. Yeah. Keep a lookout for that uh, marketing information when it comes out. Lots more cool, pretty drawings. <laughs> I guess the closest one to here would be Mount Vernon. Yeah, so, so kind of just right down the road for it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just wanted to mention I'm Karen Kurt with the Central Iowa Council of Governments, and we would be another partner potentially that could help with some of these issues, if, depending on what the county wants to take on or not take on. Um, but we help with uh, code, um, a modifying city codes. Uh, we're working already with Swisher and Oxford on updating their comprehensive plans. And then we're really uh, often the partner when it comes to uh, state grants with federal ties. So we're CDBG experts and we help communities write those for free. Sarah knows all about us and what we do, um, but I just wanted to, to put us out there as well as another uh, kind of link in all of this. So. Great, thanks Karen. Anybody the, else? The Tom plan updates that you're doing are, are a great opportunity to incorporate some vision. How does it work with the cities if they won't enforce um, nuisance properties? Like if they won't change the ordinances, can the county step in at any point? Um, that's an answer that somebody can take that on. one. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you want to go for it. Generally, it's up to the city, and the, and the county will support the city. Um, so if they won't, it's it's kind of back to if the town doesn't want to be progressive, are we going to work with them? Sorry. <laughs> we'll give you all the right examples, okay? We just can't make you do it. And sometimes it's just a point of knowing how to how to do it, what other examples other people are doing. Sometimes that can help move the needle for you. And, and Robin mentioned it earlier. I really think the connection to the Iowa League of Cities is a great way because if the league's um, not the right one to connect you, they have all the other 900 towns that are connected that are doing this. Um, Swisher's in a unique situation. I've never seen a town that size that doesn't provide water, but that doesn't mean that they can't be progressive with all the other pieces. And also the League of Cities can be facilitated meetings because sometimes you just need an outside source to be that voice yep. to help everybody come to some kind of it's hard in our small towns. You're, you're sitting next to people at church, and, and sometimes you're at odds with family members. 
experience. Uh, been there, done that. But, yeah. Can cities adopt design standards for new buildings going up in the downtowns? Yes. And that's um, early. We recommended that you take a look at our design guideline book. Yeah. That's a great place to start. But yeah, communities, many of them after they kind of, you know, guidelines are a good place to start, but some of them adopt where it's code, where this is what you're required to do. So the other thing that's really cool about design guide is you can say how substantially you comply with these recommendations might determine how much incentive you get. And so if the county does create some matching money, we want them to say, yeah, if it's not a good design, we're not going to invest in it. Same way with the city. So I've been to city council meetings when city councils say, um, we're not sure that we want to invest in this project. And I'm very quick to remind them, why in the world do you think the state would want to invest in your building when you won't? And I'm hoping the county would adopt that same attitude. As we mentioned before, it's just really important that you decide where the bar needs to be for your community, because most people will go to wherever you set the bar, but don't set your bar high, folks. You all have great, great communities. Set the bar high. People will come to where you set the bar. And then you had mentioned something in Lone Tree about Iowa Code with the empty grocery store. What were you referring to? So when a business goes out, Iowa Code has a section that says they can leave that signage there for X number of days, and then it's required to be removed. Um, what, what's a challenge is the enforcement, because no one at the state enforces that, but it's in Iowa Code. You know, and so I think depending on Josh and, and some of the county to help help with some of that enforcement, as long as you guys all get along. No, <laughs> no, we, we all get along. Um, and I know that Neil, uh, our lead building inspector, senior building inspector, he's had some conversations with town clerks already, uh, as well uh, to, to see if we can expand our uh, building inspection services that we provide. I know we work with Oxford, Swisher, and Lone Tree already, uh, but potentially could we expand that partnership to also include uh, code enforcement um, and, and even planning. So I talk with the town clerks, city clerks regularly, you know, bouncing ideas off how do we do this, how do we do that, um, and I'm really glad to do it. So, but I think, that, you know, at least the PS department we We'd love to be able to help. So, and, and the board of supervisors, I mean, they've made significant investments, you know, with the uh, economic development plan, you know, uh, mm -hmm. providing funding to ICAD for their position. So, hopefully, we can continue to uh, do a lot of good things, and it's, it's only going to get better from here. Well, it's a huge opportunity. And, like I said, I, I truly believe Johnson County could be the example for the state. And this state needs that example. Sometimes we see communities too where volunteers come together and say, hey, on this day, we're going to bring our stuff and we're going to help take down as many outdated signs as we can. And, and it's kind of a grassroots effort. They work with the city, maybe with the building people, but um, it's, it, you're going to need public-private partnerships in every community. It, it can't just be your city, it can't just be your county, it's got to be public-private, it's all working together to make that. So. Yeah, and we can stay around a little bit longer. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. We know this is a live presentation. Thanks, everybody, for your hospitality. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to everyone for coming again. Thank you to these guys. I'm sure they'll hang around for five minutes or so if you want to ask any more questions. Um, feel free to call me. Thanks. Yes.